right, guys. Hey, I'm super excited to uh, be sharing the word with you this morning. Uh, Jesus is amazing. Amen. He really is. His word is incredible. Amen. Right? Uh, we are so privileged to have the Bible, the living word of God, right, in our language that we can read and understand. How amazing it is that, you know, we have the words of God and words that we can understand. Right, process with our minds. And so, uh, you know, I want to dig in with you guys. We're going to be in Matthew 5. Uh, pick up the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and should I move anywhere to prevent the ring? Or should I? Okay. So, you guys have been on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, this is a classic, um, one of the most famous sermons of Jesus. Um, it's amazing. So he went through the Beatitudes, right, and salt, being salt and light, right? And now we're at this passage, which is a break. He's changing uh, the subject here. And this is actually a pretty challenging uh, group of verses to go through. So thank you, Andrew, for giving me this. <laughs> 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 but I'm excited. So uh, let's pray before we get in. Jesus, thank you for your word, God. Thank you that you are the living word. Thank you, uh, Holy Spirit, to remind us of the word of Jesus, to teach us the word of Jesus. You help us to walk in it and interpret it. So, uh, Holy Spirit, I'm praying that you would reveal the word and will of God to us today, that you would transform us, God. We don't want this just to be in our heads, God, but to go to our hearts and transform us, God. So, Lord, may we know your word, may we know you. God, you are the living word. Jesus, we love you, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, Matthew 5, 17, 20. So I'm going to read this. I'll be reading out ESV. So, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So, let's dig in. I want to take this verse by verse, kind of just walk through it. So, going back to verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. I have not come to abolish them but fulfill them. So, have you guys ever wondered why is Jesus even saying this? That he did not come to abolish the law or prophets. You know, why is he saying this? Why would he have to say this? You know, I don't know if you ever thought about that. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's because he lived a life that was so different than what the religious experts of the day, right? The scribes and the Pharisees were living. Right? And, you know, we see Jesus addressing the scribes and the Pharisees a lot. They come up all the time in the Gospels. And so, who were the scribes and who were the Pharisees? Right? Well, the scribes, they were basically legal experts of the day. Um, they had, you know, knowledge of the law of Moses. They could draft legal documents like Contracts for marriage, divorce, loans, inheritance, mortgages, those kinds of things, right? And basically every village had a scribe, right? A legal expert in the law of um, Pharisees, they were a special sect of Judaism, actually. So it was like a, a religious party within Judaism. And they were really zealous for the law of Moses. And they believed that, uh, like, the rites for purification should be practiced in everyday life. It wasn't just for dealings with the temple, um, for the priesthood, or for those visiting the temple, but that people should be pure in all of their life, right? So they valued the law of Moses and the prophets. Um, they also believed in something called the oral tradition of the fathers, which were um, just traditions passed down um, orally, and there were about 600 of them that they put on par with the law of Moses and the prophets. So they believe that those traditions should be kept as well. Uh, and there's a, a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus who wrote that there are about 6,000 Pharisees in the time of Christ. So no small sect 
right? It's pretty large. And they really held uh, favor with the common people. Uh, people looked up to them. Like they were, you know, holier than thou. You know, they were, you know, the culmination of, you know, what it meant to be a God-fearing, honoring Jew, right? And so Jesus, though, right, it says he didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets, right? But uh, the law, actually, this is ironic. It, the law forbade anybody from adding or subtracting from the law, right? Which is exactly what the Pharisees were doing, because they were putting the oral traditions on par with the law, right? So definitely, part of Jesus' mission was to oppose these and to abolish those, right? And so he, that's why he ruffled the feathers of the Pharisees so often, because, you know, um, he was opposing their, their worldview, their way of practicing faith. And so he didn't come to abolish the law of Moses, but he came to really abolish these additions, right? And so I think that's why he had to say this, right? It's because the, the way that the Pharisees advocated to live was actually not how God wanted them to live, right? And the people had equated that with the law and the prophets. And so Jesus is saying, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill them. And so what does it mean to fulfill? How did he fulfill? Did he actually do that? Well, yes, he did. <laughs> he did. But what does it mean? So the word fulfill, you might, you know, it means to fulfill, right? It means to complete, to accomplish, to consummate, to bring, to full realization. Right? So how did he do that? Well, one, he fulfilled the predictive prophecies of the law and prophets. Right? Uh, there's a, a couple stories in the Bible after Jesus resurrected. He appeared to the two disciples that were walking um, on the road. And he appeared to them and was revealing to them how he fulfilled all the law you know, and the prophets. How you know, those writings were speaking of him. And he later appeared to his disciples and revealed how the law and the prophets and the Psalms pointed to him. Right? And there were a lot of prophecies about... Um, a promised Messiah. So the, the idea of a Messiah, the concept of a Messiah, is fundamental to Judaism. And uh, Messiah means deliverer, um, liberator, one who was coming to um, set free and establish the uh, Davidic kingdom, to reestablish the kingdom of God on uh, earth in the faith of Judaism. And uh, so the set, this, this idea of a Messiah is central to the Jewish writings. And there are a lot of prophecies that um, foretold of his coming and what his birth would look like, what his life would look like, what his ministry would look like. And Jesus, it's amazing, he fulfilled all of these prophecies about this coming of the Messiah, the first coming of the Messiah. It's amazing. Um, so some examples of these. You guys heard of the prophet Micah. It's the book of the Bible, right? It says, um, Micah 4.2, But you, Bethlehem, Bethlehem you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of the old, from ancient of days. And this prophecy, so it's foretelling where the Messiah would be born. It's in Bethlehem. Right? And this is 700 years before Christ was born. And we know that Christ was born in Bethlehem. Scripture is telling us that. Right? But people thought he was, you know, from Nazareth. He wasn't born in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. And the prophet Micah foretold this 700, times, 700 years before Christ's birth. About that same time, there's another prophecy. These are, this is just a few examples. There's about 60, I think, prophecies of his first coming. Maybe more. I don't even know the exact number. But it's, it's a lot. So Isaiah prophesied that Christ would be born from a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Right? So Jesus, born of a virgin. I read that today. Right? Jesus was miraculously conceived right, by the Holy Spirit. Mary was a virgin. He was the Son of God. And uh, there are multiple prophecies about um, Christ's death. Isaiah 53 talks about the Messiah as a suffering servant, pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. Um, Psalm 22 
you read Psalm 22, you're like, this is a Bible song for us. And it absolutely is. It says, it was written by David, King David, a thousand years before Christ. And before crucifixion was even a capital punishment of Rome. It's before it was even invented. But it says, uh, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Right? That didn't even exist when David wrote this. He's writing prophetically under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about the promised Messiah. And really, I think Jesus is actually quoting this on the, on the cross. It starts off with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know that Jesus said that on the cross. So I believe he could have been up there and he was reciting that song, knowing that he was fulfilling it in that moment. It's amazing. Right? So, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this book, but it was called Science Speaks. It was written by Peter Stoner and Robert Newman. And uh, they were looking at the prophecies that spoke of Jesus. Uh, and they calculated, uh, this was like ratified by the American Scientific Affiliation, uh, but they looked at the, the odds of one person fulfilling just eight of the 60 or so prophecies that Christ fulfilled. Right? And they calculated, this is ratified, that it was 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Right? <laughs> so it's like 1 with 17 zeros behind it, which is crazy. Right? And like that's mind boggling. Like, what are those actually, what are those odds? What do they compute to? And so what he said, he made this illustration these odds are the odds of, let's say you cover the state of Texas with silver dollars, two feet deep. You mark one of them and throw it randomly in this pile. And then you blindfold somebody, send him out, and ask him to pick one. The odds of him picking that marked silver dollar are the odds that Jesus could have fulfilled just eight of the 60 or so prophecies. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! Come on! It's amazing. Those odds are astronomical. There's no way. Right? So this was not odds. Jesus is the promised Messiah from God. So Jesus fulfilled the predicted prophecies of the law and the prophets. Two, Jesus fulfilled the moral and legal demands of the law and the prophets, and that he fully obeyed them in their correct interpretation of them. So uh, this is a hard one to explain. I'm going to do my best on this. So, we believe that Jesus was sinless, right? Um, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin. Right? And we'll dig into that later, but he knew no sin. Jesus himself said in John 8, 46, which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? Right? And so if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Right? He was saying, I'm sinless. Who can say that? Right? You either have to be lying, you have to be crazy, or you have to be telling the truth. Right? And I don't know about you, but I don't think Jesus was a crazy person. And I don't think he was a liar. I think he was telling the truth. So he was sinless, right? So that this brings up a question: what is sin? And the reason I ask is this. If sin is defined as breaking the law of Moses, then Jesus was actually a sinner. Yeah? If, if sin is defined as breaking the law of Moses, word for word, then Jesus was a sinner. How can I say that? Well, if you look at the woman caught in the act of adultery in John 8, right? The law prescribed the law of Moses that if somebody was an adulterer, that they should be stoned to death. They should be stoned, they should be killed. And so there's that story where the woman is caught in the act of adultery. Pharisees bring the woman before Jesus to test him and say, Lord, it's commanded in the law that you know, we should stone this woman. And so Jesus, you know, he bends down, he writes in the sand. <laughs> it's like, what is he writing out of me? But he's just, you know, dude went in the sand. And they're waiting for him in response. He stands up and says, Okay, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Right? So he didn't promote this woman's stoning. In fact, he actually dissuaded it. 
Right? He left it into their hands, but um, he prevented it from happening. They all walked away one by one, the oldest, the youngest, and he said, where are your accusers? They're gone, Lord. They don't, you know. He said, I don't accuse you either, don't send them one. So he did not stone this one, he did not advocate that. So he was breaking the law of Moses. So again, sin is defined as breaking the law of Moses, that Jesus was actually a sinner. But we know that he was sinless. So what, how do we reconcile this, right? And so I think the answer comes in considering what the purpose of the law of Moses was, why the Mosaic law was given. So the law was not given um, to define what sin was so that you could avoid it and be saved, right? So I'm, not, I'm saying the law was not salvific. It was not unto salvation. The law was not given as a prescription to show you how to be saved. The law can never save anybody, right? And the scriptures say that over and over and over again. Paul writes that in so many of his letters, right? If the law could save, the old covenant could save, there would be no need for a new one, right? But the Bible does teach why the law was given. It says the law was given, number one, to show us what sin was, to shut up all other sin, it says, or to show that all are actually sinners, and to point us to Christ. So the purpose of the law was to show us that we, we can't be sinners, that we're not okay on our own, that we do need a Savior. The law came to point us to the Savior. The law isn't the Savior. Does that make sense? Keeping the law doesn't save us. It points us to the one who will save us. Mm. Right? And so, you know, Jesus kind of sums up the law. Somebody came to him, a lawyer, and said, uh, the Testament said, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus responds, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first, great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So God was then and is now not concerned about a mere outward conformity to a set of rules, but he cares about our hearts and where our affections are directed. So Jesus was sinless, not because he kept the law of Moses. It's because he loved the Lord as God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. And he did that perfectly. He did not sin because he was fulfilling what the law tells us in different ways, what God's will for us is. To love him and to love each other. So that's what the law is all about. Right? And I'm sure I could dig way farther into the law of Moses and those things. But I want, I want you to understand that, that the law of Moses was not for salvation. It was not given to show us how to be saved. Or how to, how for us to orient our lives so that we could receive the favor of God. That was never its intent. The law was to tutor us to Christ, to show us that, um, you know, we need something beyond the law to save us. And it was given to really awaken sin in us. Paul talks about, you know, the law produced in me all sorts of covetousness, all sorts of sin. So is the law bad. No, the law is good. But sin took advantage of the commandment and produced death within. Right, and shuts up all our sin. So, Jesus fulfilled what the law was really all about. And three, Jesus fulfilled the penalty of sin, which was defined in the law and the prophets for us and his death on the cross. So, sin is a dis disagreement and separation from the author and sustainer of life. So I asked, what is sin earlier? Sin is not a violation of the law of Moses. Sin is a separation that comes uh, from us choosing to be God instead of us submitting ourselves to God. Right? Sin comes about because we want to be Lord. Or like we want to be equal or above God, just like Satan did in the beginning. Satan wanted to call the shots. He wanted to be worshipped. Right? And we've done that with our own lives. Right? When we take matters into our own hands. And so that's what sin is. Right? It's a separation from the author and sustainer of life. Right? And when we're separated from the author of life, death is the natural result. 
right? So Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, right? So death is the natural outcome of our sin. It's really not a punishment so much as just a consequence of what happens when we are separated from the author of life, right? When we come out from under God's protection. So we know that death is a natural consequence of sin. It cannot be undone by us because we committed it. But Jesus took on the natural consequence and demand of our sin and set us free from the death that was rightfully ours. He took our place, right? So, you know, that's a beautiful exchange, right? Where we deserve death because we have separated ourselves from God. We have come out from the author of life and we deserve death because that's what we chose for ourselves, that we deserve that consequence. But Jesus came and took on the consequence for us so that we could be set free, right? And we could be rejoined to the author of life. So Jesus came to fulfill the penalty that we deserved because of our sin, right? So he, again, he fulfilled the prophetic you know, prophecies that are spoken of the promised Messiah. He fulfilled the law and its correct interpretation of what it was really about. And he fulfilled the penalty that we deserve by dying for us on the cross. So that's why we came to fulfill the law. He did it. So let's look at verse 18 and 19. Keep moving here. Wow. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So, again, what does this all mean? Does this mean that we should actually be observing all of Mosaic law? Should we not be eating pork and wearing blended fabrics and all these things? No, right? Because Jesus fulfilled it all. He accomplished it, right? So I want to read a scripture real quick. Hebrews 9. And again, the Holy Testament is full of how Jesus instituted a new covenant. That's why he came, right? The law of Moses was the old covenant, but Jesus came to institute a new covenant. So Hebrews 9, 15, 17 says, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal life, since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. So again, Jesus fulfilled what the Mosaic law required. It is all accomplished in him. He fulfilled the old covenant and has instituted a new covenant by his death. Right? And so we're under the new covenant. So verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, the Pharisees, they were viewed as super conformable to the law of Moses, the most celebrated teachers, professors, and demonstrators of the law. And Jesus said that people's righteousness had to exceed theirs to even enter the kingdom of heaven. And somebody looking at the Pharisees, that would be mind boggling, right? Because they were like the pinnacle. They're like, these guys are so righteous. Right? The people looked up to them as examples. Right? But Jesus is saying, hey, your righteous has to exceed theirs. And so they must have been like, what? You know, how <laughs> do I do that? <laughs> right? Uh, that would be mind-boggling for somebody who defined righteousness by appearance of the law. Right? And that's the point I've been getting at over and over. True righteousness was never established by keeping the law of Moses. <coughs> Galatians 2, 16 to 21 says, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And that justified means to be made right with God, to be declared righteous. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Romans 10. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul here is talking about the Jews who 
you know, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, sought to establish their own by obeying the law. So over and over again, guys, righteousness does not come by adhering to the law. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, these guys, you know, your righteousness has to exceed theirs to be in the kingdom of heaven because this isn't righteousness to begin with. Right? And uh, there's a scripture in Habakkuk, a book in the Bible, um, 2.4. It says, the righteous shall live by his faith. And that's quoted like three times in the New Testament. And Paul goes into that. But Habakkuk says, you know, the righteous does, does not live by adhering the law, it's by faith in God. So what does that mean? What does faith mean? It's a complete trust and devotion. Oh, wow. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> complete trust in God, not in ourselves. Right? The Jews sought to establish righteousness on their own because they were ignorant of the righteousness of God. And righteousness isn't from keeping the law or you know, keeping the rules. But true righteousness is, come, is found in having faith in God. And faith is really complete trust, uh, devotion to God, reliance on Him, faithfulness to God in our hearts. Loving him with all of our hearts, soul, mind, strength. Loving our neighbor ourself. That's what faith is all about. And that's what Jesus came to do, and to do perfectly. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So there's a, a quote by a biblical commentator, Matthew Poole. As Christ was not made sin, by any sin inherent in him, neither are we made righteous by any righteousness inherent in us, but by the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. So he uses this word imputed, right? And the KJV uses that word in different places, in, in Romans and other books of the Bible. But that word imputed, it means accounted to, accredited to one's account. So, the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he, he who knew no sin became sin. Our sin was imputed to Jesus. It was credited to his account. While his righteousness, Jesus, was credited to our account. So there's a beautiful exchange there where all of our brokenness, all of our death, all of our sin and shortcomings are imputed to Christ, and Christ takes them upon himself so that we can become His righteousness. We receive His faithfulness to God. We receive the relationship that He has with God because of His faithfulness. So that's what imputed means. It's this exchange. Right? And so we, we can't do a bunch of things to erase our sin. Right? Or to overdo it or to bury it by our own works. Because that's not what righteousness is. Righteousness isn't by us working hard to undo what we have done. Righteousness is found by acknowledging we can't do it. And Jesus did it. Jesus is the only one. Right? So Jesus gets the glory, not us. So our faith is what unites us to Christ. So when God sees faith in Christ, He sees union in Christ. And when he sees union with Christ, he sees the righteousness of Christ is ours. The beautiful exchange. And so, you know, now that if we have received our righteousness, I'm going to hit on this too. We know that righteousness isn't defined by us keeping the law, or keeping the rules, or doing the right things. We can't learn that. But uh, at the same time, Scripture talks about, um, like 2 Corinthians 7 1. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Right? So what that means is that we do have a part in walking in such a way that we walk in the fear of the Lord, the reverence of God, the love of God, faith in God, just because we have the righteousness of Christ doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want. Right? We receive the righteousness of Christ because He is Savior. Right? 
And as Savior, Jesus is Lord of our lives as well. He can't be Savior without being Lord, right? If we were dead in our sins, and we were, all of us, and He made us alive with Christ, we are only alive because of Christ. So if it weren't for Christ, we would be dead, right? So we, we don't really have any say in our lives, right? Because Christ owns us. Because we're only alive because of him. You see what I'm saying? That's right. So he is Lord. Jesus is Lord. But he's a good Lord. He's awesome. He loves us more than we love ourselves. We can trust him with our lives because he knows what we need more than we need it. That's right. right? If left to our own devices, we'll utterly ruin our lives. We'll make wrong choices for us. We'll choose selfishly. We'll live a selfish, stupid life. But Jesus loves us too much to allow us to do that. Amen. Right? Amen. And so we can trust him with our lives. And uh, we need to because he's God, he's Lord. All authority in heaven and earth is his. Right? He has authority over our lives. Right? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess right. that Jesus is Lord. Right? Amen. Uh, either we do it willingly or, <laughs> you know, we'll do it unwillingly at the end of the day. But uh, we should do it now willingly because he is Lord. And uh, so, you know, there's an aspect of us, um, you know, partnering with Christ. He leads us. You know, the Holy Spirit guides us in all truth. He reminds us of the words of Jesus. Uh, John 16 says, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. So there's a way and a will of God for us to walk in, right? And he wants to lead us into that, into his will. You know, and so that's a part. It's, it doesn't, you know... Um, it doesn't give us righteousness, right? But we walk in the righteousness of Christ, in the faithfulness of Christ, in the, in the love, and fear, and faith of God, right? And so Jesus was righteous, I'm going to say this. He was righteous not because he kept all the law, but he kept all the law because he was righteous. Does that make sense? So his righteousness didn't come because he kept all the law. He was already righteous. He was already faithful to God. And so he kept all the requirements of the law, the love of God, the love of man, because he was righteous. Because he was faithful to God. God's Father. And so, three things to get from this message. One, what righteousness is. Righteousness is not a moral stamp and byproduct of you keeping God's commandments. Righteousness is not something you have to earn in God's eyes, or else you incur his wrath. That's not what righteousness is. Righteousness, or right standing with God, comes as a result of what Jesus did. Loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And loving our neighbor and us, ourselves. And he's the only one who did that. <laughs> we will fail with that over and over and over again. But Jesus did not. And that's what righteousness is, faithfulness to God. Love of God, love of man. And righteousness, he became sin and no sin, that his righteousness might be imputed to us. Our sin was imputed to him, his righteousness imputed to us. And this righteousness, this righteousness of Jesus, is necessary for us to be in a relationship with God. Because Jesus was the only one who did not have a break as a relationship with God. And we are, we are brought into that union in Christ. So that's what righteousness is. The second is how righteousness is applied. So just because Christ has done all this doesn't mean it's automatically applied to us. Right? That would be called universalism. Right? That it's just automatically applied. Everybody is you know, grafted into the family of God. And that's not true. We have a part in posturing ourselves to receive this righteousness. Right? First, we have to acknowledge that we cannot be righteous on our own. Second, we have to acknowledge that Jesus was perfectly righteous before God, and this is why he came, to do what we could not. Right? We know the scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever might believe in him might not perish but have life. So third, we have to believe in Jesus. We have to believe that Jesus is the only one who can save us from sin and is the only 
one, the only way to the Father. We have to acknowledge that without Jesus, we would be dead in our sin, that it's only from Him that we have life, and therefore, He is Lord, and He has the right to our life. So that's what it means to believe in Jesus, to receive what He has done for us on our behalf, and to give our lives to Him, to receive Him as Savior, to receive Him as Lord. Right? It's not one or the other. We cannot separate the saving aspects from the Lordship aspects. Right? If He is Savior, He is Lord. And the third is walking in righteousness. I didn't major on this, but it's a big part of our walk in Jesus. We can't receive the righteousness of God and do as we please because Jesus is Lord. Right? So God cares too much about us to let us just do whatever we want. Right? We have to learn from Jesus' righteousness and allow him to lead us by his righteous spirit into living a holy life. And holy means lives that are just set apart in him. So your life can be holy because it's not yours. Right? It's set apart to God. Right? Again, holy isn't just doing the rules. Holy means you're set apart to God and you're God's completely. So Jesus is the one that fulfilled the law of the prophets. Jesus was perfectly faithful to God, righteous, he became sin on the cross that we might be reconciled to God and credited his right standing with God to us. Jesus has made the way for us to be made God's people who can know his ways and walk in them. And how glorious that is, how amazing that is, that we can be restored, we can be children of God, that we can know God and walk with God. So and that's good news, right? That's good news. So, that's what I have to share today. And you can come back up. So, what righteousness is. Let me just read that again. What righteousness is, how righteousness is applied, and walking in righteousness. We have a part in that as well. So, I think we're going to take a moment now, and uh, let's respond to this by receiving righteousness. Let's take a, a moment say, you're in this room, you say, yeah, I, um, I recognize this morning, one, I was thinking two, two different ways. One, I've been depending on my own good works to be able to get righteousness, and this morning I recognize, you know what, no, I need to put my faith in Jesus instead of my own thing that I've been trying to accomplish. And the other, other this morning is, hey, I recognize, hey, I, I am a non-believer this morning, I, I, I know I've been doing my own thing apart from what God wants me to be doing, and, and I know it's not working. And this morning, I recognize that Jesus came and lived a life that that uh, was perfect for me, and He went all the way to the cross so that I can receive His perfection. And He's like, you know what? This morning, I I need Christ's perfection because I know I'm not perfect. I'm not even cutting cutting the grain. That's how, that's how I say it. But uh, let's take a moment this morning and pray. And this room, I, I encourage you to say, yes, Lord, I receive Jesus, your righteousness. God, forgive me for trying to do it on my own. Or if you're in the boat, you're saying, you know what? God, I, I recognize I, I, I have done things wrong. I have sinned against you. I'm not even considering uh, what it looks like to love you with all of my heart, soul, and strength. And so I need you, Jesus, to cover me with your righteousness because I know I'm not even pursuing you. This morning, let's take a moment to respond, and then I'll come up and bless us.